Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. My name is Eric. I'm here with Michael on this goddamn double feature. Goddamn and, motherfucking uh, we have double feature. Two, <laughs> just, Sorry. What are the movies? Uh, well, I had two films on my bucket list this time. One was... Uh, <laughs> Your bucket list. One was The Ledge. As long as the other is not the film The Bucket List, I think we're <laughs> no, in no, no. good shape. One was The Ledge. The other was Swim With Dolphins, but I guess you guys changed it to Cemetery Junction. Oh, God. Pilkington. Um, we got a little bit of feedback last week. That uh, we didn't make fun of God enough on our show. Are you serious? Yeah, one of these emails here. I got uh, a couple actually. Th- this one Is says, "Your um, end already." This says, uh, "Pick on someone your own size," which I found interesting. What? We also got an email here that says, "Ooh, mocking God, Eric and Michael bullying the defenseless again." So a lot of people are no. Don't look at me like that. No one emailed us. Oh, okay. nobody cares about God. Jeez, um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Like. I told you before, no, you need silly music behind you because your deadpan's it's, getting too uh, good. I know. It's, well, you know, I've had nearly five fucking years of practice. Let's not get all year endy. I don't, yeah. you got me yeah. in a mindset you to start me. celebrating. We still have many an episode yeah. to go. So let's try and get through them instead one at a time. Instead of being the year end spoiler free bullshit, we're going to spoil the hell out of the ledge and Cemetery Junction. Both. You haven't seen the ledge and you want to, uh, oblige the unspoken rule of double feature which is watch the fucking films yep uh then you can skip right over to cemetery junction with the chapters or you could skip right to the end and find out uh where the blood's coming from next week also a good reason to use chapters is uh this is a double feature where we're going to be talking about some things outside of these two movies we got a little Penn Jillette going on today i think and a little ricky gervais Stephen merchant carl oh, fucking yeah. pilkington very true there's chapters for those that aren't going to skip Welcome to a recording on the internet where two atheists are annoying for about 45 minutes of your time. <laughs> uh, maybe just use the chapters to skip right to the end, figure out what to do next week, and then you won't have to put up with any yeah. of this. I wonder if there's anybody that just listens to our show and for weeks now has just skipped the films. Oh, God, I would end. hope everyone Is there anybody that thinks our bits, feature. like in the beginning and end, are just the best parts of the show? Sometimes I feel that way. Yeah, you know, sometimes I do too. Uh, this week's going to be good, though. This yeah. is going to be a good, uh, this good is a round of shows. This show. It's a break from vagina chat uh, for at least one week. So let's get on with our girlfriend stealing Sky Pig double feature then. Oh yeah, that's the one with the uh, eating out of Liv Tyler's vagina. Damn it. Failed already. Uh, so the first movie is The Ledge. This is a, a 2011 movie. And before we say anything, just briefly. Okay. What's going on with this oil refinery time lapse thing? And the, how, is the, how, how do they do this? I don't know how they do it. I can't really figure out why they're doing it. There's Except an, to be impressive, maybe. It's an opening um, shot. I mean, it's an establishing shot, sure. right? And I, I don't know if there's a, a metaphorical break it down purpose here. I think it's just an establishing I, I, shot. I want to go back and kind of figure out whether or not it's of the ledge itself. I think, well, I know the church is in there that they show a couple times. And yeah. the refinery he works at, I assume that's where the smoke's coming from. But the, uh, the objects are not moving any faster than normal. But it's almost like a, a time lapse. Well, the, the sun yeah. is moving. Fa- How is this happening? How know. did they do this? Must be the power of God. Uh, rarely do I see an effect in movies that looks so simple that I just, I'm fucking stumped. I have no yeah. clue how you would even <laughs> accomplish this. Uh, this is by director and writer Matthew Chapman. That's another thing we're going to see in both of these movies, director, writers. And it's character heavy. Uh, it's, it's very it's character gonna heavy. It's going to be one more. I think we're talking about characters quite a bit. You know what I like about the way the movie depicts these characters before mm-hmm. we talk about the characters okay. themselves. Right from the beginning, we get these depictions of the characters at their jobs when their guard is down. You know what I mean? It's not uh it's not the customer facing version sure. of the characters. Sure. You know, when we're looking at this hotel, if you went into the hotel to talk to one of these characters at a desk or request a manager or whatever the fuck Gavin's job is, mm-hmm. they would not talk to you about quite the same things. Right. Um there'd be fewer dildos. Yeah, well, that's the thing, right? It's uh, It just makes them very real people. They swear, they don't wear pants, they talk about <laughs> dildo, you know what I mean? Yeah. These are, uh, these are backroom things, but they're not bad at their job. There's nothing to indicate uh, that these people aren't good. When, when Gavin, uh, Gavin's our, our main character here, mm-hmm. when he's giving the tour to uh, Shayna 
of the hotel and introducing her to the various people. They're all a little bit sassy. Sure. But this isn't, um, you know, office space or yeah. uh, terrible bosses. Was horrible that what that bosses. The horrible boss? I have never even seen that. But it's I, also not Tower Heist. Or that Mike Judge movie with um, Jason Bateman. This isn't a movie about people who are bad at their job. We're to assume that they do a fine job. Uh-huh. They, uh, they're they just very real people behind the scenes, and we get to see that right away. So we know you know, where the camera has positioned us. Right. It's not showing us the, you know, when we talk about Cemetery Junction, we're going to talk about the coolest scenes these characters have ever been in. That's what's being captured. Right. Uh, when we're talking about the ledge, this is just the people at their most real, uh, perhaps their most vulnerable uh, places. But sure. here it's their, it's their most vulgar when they're at work. It kind of makes me um, it, sort of romance in my head over the idea that, you know, if people who all worked at a hotel didn't have to worry about offending really the minority, you could walk into a hotel, uh, spend a few minutes talking to somebody, and maybe have a conversation with that chick about yeah. the dildo. Or, sure. you know, maybe Gavin just wouldn't be wearing pants at the front right. counter. But you got to be professional. Well, yeah. I think that's kind of who Gavin is. He, um, he jokes with Shayna about blowjobs right away. Right. I, I get the feeling you wouldn't have to talk to Gavin for more than a few minutes in any setting. Before he just, you know, dropped the proverbial pants. Yeah, I think I think the big thing with Gavin is that he's a very real guy. He's very comfortable with himself, but he's also aware that there is a... I mean, he has a job. Yeah. And I think he's... He's, he's responsible, certainly. Yeah, he's a responsible That's guy. That's why he's, he's on a ledge. He's aware of, you know, being on someone else's time. When yes. he's working, when he's being paid, he's, you know, he's going to be a responsible guy. But if he's not going to be paid, he doesn't... Well, have yeah, this that's pretense instinct. and that kind of i mean that kind of feeds into a lot of what ends up happening with him For when sure. he goes over to have dinner with shana and joe because he doesn't have the kind of respectful facade of you believe this i believe that as sure. long as i don't address it it's not going to turn into a right. problem well because he's also kind of an aggressive guy sure. he's a confrontational yeah. guy but yeah i mean that's instinctive you know there's a, a great it's a very brief moment but when he's on the ledge and Hollis is up there talking to him and Hollis gets a call or whatever, he says a very strange thing to him. You know, Hollis kind of comes back or whatever. And he says, oh, do you have to go? You yeah. know what I mean? Like when you're talking about respecting other people's time, he's literally going to commit suicide. He knows in his head he's going to do this. There's right. no, qu- there's no, you know, talking him out of it or whatever. He, this is absolutely happening. And so he's basically saying to Hollis, hey, if you get a jet, I mean, I understand I'm going to be here. Right. So, you know, if yeah. you need me, you can come back or whatever, right. uh, unless the clock strikes and then, uh, you know, I get a bail. Then you have to catch me down there. Peace out. But, you know, when he jokes with uh, Shane, he's really forward, do the charitable thing, have sex with me on a regular basis, mm-hmm. that sort of thing. I mean, they're being flirtatious, but still, it's very forward. And, uh, and she seems reserved, but only because she has a husband. You know, that's her. When he starts making cock jokes or whatever, she um, she closes up, but she only does that. Right. Because you know, that's she, the place she's in. Yeah. But she's not. It's she's her not, situation. Yeah. You know, she's she not goes, well, I have a husband. She's not rejecting it. Yeah. She's just, I, guess, I think she gets uncomfortable because she doesn't know how to handle it in a way that she feels like is appropriate for yeah. her situation, it's but her she doesn't feel Mary like it's inappropriate. She says. Yeah, there's, uh, there's definitely a line that becomes blurred, and that's the struggle she's having. Mm-hmm. You know, he's a bit uh, manipulative when it comes to that. Gavin is, sure. I mean. Very. Uh, but I mean, that's human. You know, you want something, and you're in a crap situation, so you strategize. Sure. That's well, just, I, I think, all he's left with. To take a uh, to take a thing from the second film today, it's kind of the idea of throw your heart out in front of you and sure, then okay. you know run ahead to catch it. He knows what he wants, but it's not the kind of thing where you know you you can't step B question mark. Yeah, you know, <laughs> right, right. Uh, you need to have a plan, and his I mean his plan seems more like an agenda. Yeah, but it is. I mean, he's executing it based on you know his ideals and the way he expects it's going to work out. It's sure. the same as any other thing you want. Yeah. It's the same as deciding to save up money. Sure. It's just, it seems you're more preparing for the because future. you're using people, right, but that's right. because the ultimate goal is to be with a person. Yeah. You know, he's planting a thought and this is something interesting. And I want to ask you about this and you're a, a very small sample of the entire population. So double feature show at gmail.com. Feel free to email. Is this in. about inception? <laughs> no, it's not a, it's not that kind of planting a thought. 
Gavin's breakdown. Yes. Right. Where he's, uh, he's addressing, you know, and I love the way they do that too, rather than showing it. It's sort of that, um, it's that South Park bank heist. Oh, here's how we're going to do it. And then as they show it, you realize you're seeing the actual height. I'm going to credit right. South Park for that and not what they're spoofing. Sure. But uh, you plan a thought and then she masturbates and lets the thought in and maybe sure. he says, I love you. And, you know, that's how things begin. I think so. I'm just going to kind of put this out there um, because I've had thoughts like this in my head. And I feel like maybe this is universally human, but no one has ever spoken it aloud until Gavin did it in this film. Have you, I mean, it, it just seems so evil and manipulative. So I feel bad even admitting to that. Yeah, but do but you ever find yourself in a place like sure, that? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, I do know you think exactly, that's pretty universal? I don't know if it's universal. It's difficult to or say. Or we just bad as, people well, and so is Gavin. So here's why, here's why it's difficult to talk about it on a level of, mm-hmm. on a, on a wider scale. Sure. Because I believe you said during the watching of The Ledge, you know how they wrote this character? They listen to our show for four years <laughs> right. and then just kind of put that in a character. Right, right. And it's true. so, I mean, it's, we agree with Gavin. Yeah. We're on board with Gavin. And I don't know, I can definitely tell you a handful of people I know personally who probably don't do that. Sure. But sure. I can also give you a handful of people who very well may. I just, didn't I know, know I do. And that's really all I ever say anything about on the show. So <laughs> right. let's say right. yes, 100%. Everybody does it. I feel like someone has brought to the silver screen uh, a thing that may not be spoken aloud. Sure. Um, almost like a taboo. Just a, Like a peeing th- in the shower. A thing we don't talk about. You and a Seinfeld reference? Is that is really that happening? Is that in Seinfeld? That is in Seinfeld. I've, There's a pee in the shower episode. I didn't know that. I don't watch Seinfeld. So I don't know that we could say we agree with Gavin on everything 100%. He's kind of an interesting character as a protagonist like that. He... Uh, you know, just beyond uh, being manipulative, I think there's a couple things that make him a not dick. quite the... Yeah, he's not the perfect protagonist, yeah, right? Sure. I don't know that I could have a confrontational dinner conversation yeah. like that, even as adamant as I am about going out on the internet and rambling right. about atheism all the time. Sure. Also, he's... Um, well, we pretend it's about movies. That's our, that's our <laughs> right. secret. Yeah, that's the guys there. This is a guy who's inspired by the universe, uh-huh. but in a way where he's incredibly cheesy. Yeah, you know in what a I gay mean? way. Yeah, he he wants to... But he's not gay, but ne- in a gay way. Never has anyone laid down in the grass with a woman to stare up at, at the stars in such a gay way yeah. as Gavin explaining his love for the universe. Yeah, and the whole thing about how the light from the stars is from so far away. Right, right. Yeah. Yet he's totally right. He is. He's, he's once absolutely again totally right. right. It's just super gay. That was the perfect thing to say. And it's the answer to some to giving yourself over to something bigger than yourself. Yep. The answer is look around you. Look how fucking big it is. <laughs> right. I think I'd prefer that method. I think I'd prefer look around you. Look how fucking big it is. But you know what? It worked. Yes, it did. He also totally tells mean jokes at, I mean, the meanest jokes at the absolute wrong time. Yeah. Like, um, you know, oh, sorry, your kid died, I guess. She's up in heaven. That totally exists, huh? Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. You know what I mean? Like, fucking terrible. Uh, he's, you know, he's confrontational like that and kind of a dork, I guess. But in the end, he is right. And so that makes him not a cookie cutter protagonist. Right. If he were a cookie cutter protagonist, he would destroy everyone else in this movie and we would not feel for any of them. Yeah. Strangely, we do. It's true. Shane is an easy one because she's another protagonist, but she's, uh, What makes her a great middle person in this religious struggle is that she's there because uh, not for the religion itself, but because she's damaged. Right. She's there because she needs a kind of crutch. Sure. And where Joe says, I will let this light into your life. Gavin says that is literally an imaginary crutch made of religion. Right. That's his argument. Well, Gavin says on the bus, he says something along the lines of you, you're mistaking love for, you know, someone being there to help you. I don't sure. remember. It's, it's, well, far yeah, but more he also says you need a sky daddy. Pig. This is what I'm talking about right. when I say he's kind of a dick, but it's an ends for her. It's, um, it takes the suffering away. You know, it's as she responds to, to that comment, you know, she wants somebody to love her. She wants something in her life that's, that's there. So she's not in it for the truth. Right. It's not a, a quest to find the ultimate answers. It's something to keep her warm and safe. Sure. Little did she know that's what Cunnilingus is for. And man, does she, um, never mind. Well, and then there's Joe. And what's strange is I like Joe. I'm not yeah. even really sure I'm supposed to like Joe, 
and you know, in the end, he's a terrible character. He's yeah. a terrible well, person. I think. I think the whole idea with Joe is that you can not hate him. Yeah. Based on the fact that you can accept that he feels like he's doing the right thing. Okay. Sure. I think if you can, if if you can watch him and because he Love doesn't people feel, hate religion. He doesn't that, feel like an evil guy. That? Right. He's wrong. He's mistaken. He's been misled. But really, you can only blame someone so much. Sure. For just being wrong. Yeah, there's a lot of endearing things about him. I mean, he's the type of person, Joe is a put your money where your mouth is sure. kind of person. He believes the things he says. Mm -hmm. He is that type of, um, you know, sincere person. He tries to convert uh, Gavin yeah. all the time. He invites him over for these little dinner party things. Sure. And he says blatantly to him, no, I'm closed minded. I'm uh, going to go ahead and not allow any room to believe that God doesn't exist. But you know what? Why don't you come over and try yeah, and convince you me? You need anyways. to be a little bit more open minded. Yeah, yeah, right. Not me though. I'm totally closed minded, which is why you would be a perfect convert. It's that thing I said so long ago on one of these goddamn episodes where I blabbered on and on about religion. Uh, the fire thing. I just briefly, I think my point was if you or I thought, you know, walking into another room would cause you to burn alive, we would try to stop the other person. If I had secret knowledge, that you were doing something that was going to cause your eminent demise for all eternity in a painful manner, I would stop you from doing that thing. Sure. So if you're going to walk into a burning building, I would do literally everything. There is nothing on planet Earth, really, besides, I guess, maybe harming myself, that I would not do to convince you not to go in there. Mm -hmm. Similarly, if I believed you were going to rot in hell for all eternity, I would feel the exact sure. same way. If I thought hell were a real place and you would go to it, not just momentarily, right. not just through your death, but forever. Yeah, well, it it makes Joe an okay character because he does empathize for the people who aren't, quote, saved. And mm -hmm. they have this conversation. And it there are people, there are religious people out there who don't bother going out to convert because, oh, you know, I believe in God. I believe they're called religious moderates. Yeah. And they, they say, I'm saved. Are you saved? Oh, that's fine. Yeah, if you're not saved, no big deal, you know, to each his own. But Let's respect each other's that's opinions. That's basically just saying that you don't fully, you either don't fully believe or you're just a bad person. Yeah, you're a terrible Too, person. You, you want a bigger, bigger real estate up in, up in uh, your cloud mansion. Skyland. Yeah. Skyland. Where people from all times and places exist together in unified harmony and that doesn't cause any problems because it's heaven. There's no problems in sure. heaven. Right, can't. Also, are there roads in heaven, as David Cross once asked? I don't have any background on that subject so we're really building joe up which i'm a little proud of right now because i'm going to tear joe down with a single idea the problem here is very simple if i could briefly there's a, a kind of an intro to this book that i've been super fucking pumped about um I, it's three sentences long or so and i'm gonna read it really quick and this i think uh states the problem better than <laughs> maybe i ever could this is from a book called god no uh, it's Pendulette's book, uh, came out fairly recently mm -hmm. in the opening. It states, if God, however you perceive him, her, it told you to kill your child, would you do it? If your answer is no, in my booklet, you're an atheist. There is doubt in your mind. Love and morality are more important than your faith. If the answer is yes, please reconsider. This is a book uh, I know this is not double sleepy nap time, mm -hmm. so I promise to keep this brief. Um, God, no, there's a long subtitle like books do uh, yeah. something awesome, books. atheist tales, something you might be an atheist. I yeah. don't know what it is. Point is, of all the things that are in this book, this tiny little forward whatever intro thing is one of my favorite things. Yeah. It basically just says, hey, you believe in God there, huh? If God told you you killed your child, how would you do it? Would that change your opinion of God? Right. That's everything I feel about religion. Sure. And it's the very put your money where your mouth is that, um, right. you know, that Joe's talking but about. But apparently Joe would probably... Well, kill. he would kill his yeah. child is the problem. And Penn is simply stating this, it's this great thing of atheism and humanism coming together. If you would, if you have that conviction, please reconsider. I love Penn's book for a lot of reasons. There's a little bit of atheism stuff in it, but it's also just sort of this... If you were an atheist, how might you have lived 50 years of your life? Right. What would that be like? <laughs> and there are these incredible stories in it of things that someone without a God did and things that, you know, are uh, have some vaguely religious punchline to them. They're just, uh, man, they are 
great fucking stories. I cannot love that that book enough. So back to Joe. Joe is driven to kill by his convictions, and that just can't happen. That's wrong. That yep. is bad. Bad bad time. Joe is also driven by Patrick fucking Wilson, who yeah. is amazing. There is every time we see Patrick Wilson, especially in this movie, he's but, an HD. Yeah, well, yeah, what's that about? <laughs> I don't know. He is just a he's sharp, a sharp motherfucker. Actor. Certainly is. Um, well, we saw him earlier in Hard Candy, right. where he had a similar brooding thing about him, where sure. in the beginning he's sweet and sincere, so says his actions, uh-huh. uh, sort of. I mean, he's meeting an underage girl in a coffee shop, but there's always something dark about him. That's so true in this film. There's something just off about him. He's the first person in Gavin's own retelling of his story uh, that he kind of says hi to yeah. or whatever, walks by him in the hallway. Little do you have any idea that that is the reason right gavin is about to jump off a building right. is that smiley happy guy right there i think a lot of i mean what what fuels patrick wilson as such a heavy actor but especially in his portrayal of joe is joe is this guy who's very very i guess i mean standard quote well raised mm-hmm. you know he's etiquette that whole kind of he's proper is what yeah, you're saying that's it he's got a proper upbringing and the problem with a proper upbringing, especially when juxtaposed against Gavin, is he says maybe 10% of what's going on in his head. Yeah. And the other 90% is really dark, fucked sure. up shit. Sure. And you can see it in his eyes, but what comes out of his mouth is really calculated and polite and inoffensive. And that makes it all the more scary because it's basically watered down versions where you kind of have to imagine in your head where where the exaggeration is and what he's implying and that just makes it so much scarier are you sure the thing you're seeing in his eyes is not the eye shine from the lighting in this film? i can't I, it's probably a little both i love the lighting in this film i especially love uh when patrick wilson uh when joe is getting all weepy at the end and you know he's, it's the scene with the gun and he's talking to gavin and he has kind of that backlight from the sun, but then there's that creepy blue sure. underlight. Yeah. The one that if you looked at it in the, the frame, you would think there's no reason in that scene for him to have a light on his floor, but it makes him look creepy as fuck, so yeah. you don't question it at all. All of the interior shots, especially the shots uh, inside Joe and Shana's apartment, are gorgeous. I would love to have a sort of a spoiler one sheet of, Liv Tyler in a ball gag. Yeah. Just staring at the camera. What a great fucking frame. You asked me about that, though, about the eye shine. You can see that um, really specifically in the scene where she's laying in bed with Gavin. Mm -hmm. Kind of this very strange look when her eyes get glassy. And it's an effect from uh, basically the reflection of a light. And when lights are shaped in a specific way or of a certain intensity, when uh, an actor's eyes are very glassy... You can see that there's a great promo shot of Fringe. I'll put it on the website. If you look up the Century for the, the website that's on there. But uh, I shine, kind of a cool effect yeah. of photography we will maybe never mention again. All that stuff you said about Joe is, is what I love about this movie. I love those conversations, and I love the, uh, the unsafe places the movie goes, the, the things other movies don't show us. All of these people with different views... And just seeing how they kind of rub up against each other, yeah. how those characters interact when everybody kind of speaks their mind, mm-hmm. even when some people are more reserved about it. Sure. You know, that becomes part of the movies forcing them to have these conversations. You know, Gavin's roommate is the kind of person who's more reserved. He doesn't even mind the gay bashing at the dinner table. Right. They'll put up with that because he's quiet and polite, sure. but the film still forces him to deal with that. You know, he's the uh, the type of guy, I mean, that, that gay couple, they go to church. They try to get married anyways, you know. I'd, as an atheist myself, I wouldn't uh, fake pray, right. but Gavin would. So these are showing, you know, these people are definitely not painted into corners. They are not stereotypes. Mm-hmm. These are people with, uh, I mean, I imagine they built a belief system for them first, Matthew Chapman comes up with these ideas. I'm going to have an atheist and a fundamental Christian and, you know, a a damaged goods. Yeah. And we're going to, you know, build those ideas and then see what characters grow out of them, which is an incredible approach for making realistic, very human characters and still talking about ideas. Absolutely. It's the kind of thing, you know, when we talked about the invention of lying, uh, the other Ricky Gervais movie we did on the show, 
uh, there was that deathbed question. What do you say to to someone? Sure. And, you know, in this movie, they, they sort of arrive at the conclusion it's all about framing. Uh, you know, his book doesn't say everyone goes to heaven. Truth is, if you're not Christian, you go to hell. That's, you know, right. his truth. There was one other thing I want to touch on just briefly because I find it kind of an interesting soft spot I have for this movie. Um, it reminds me of this weird... Uh, I'm going to call it a Jason Mraz thing oh my God. in hopes that that doesn't stick because I don't want to ever have to say Jason Mraz thing uh-huh. ever again on the show. I've never really understood uh, pop music. Yeah. Uh, modern, what would you call that? Contemporary pop, yeah, I guess. I guess. Until one day that it clicked for me. So in case anyone else doesn't get it or you as a musician have a unique insight into this, um, one of the girls who is in our intro, mutual uh-huh. friend of ours, is a huge Jason Mraz fan, right? And so uh, back when I did that intro, we were hanging out a ton and she gave me like a Jason Mraz CD. I'm listening to this. And the thing that was amazing to me about this CD is that it is the lowest common denominator of music. Absolutely. The songs are about these things that every human being can relate to. So you can't help but kind of go, oh, I'm feeling down today because of this specific thing that I bet no other human beings going through. Yeah. And then you listen to one of these fucking songs and it is describing sure. the thing that's happening. Right. And suddenly you feel like there's another person in uh-huh. the universe who get, hey, Jason Mraz had this problem too. Yeah. And I've started to notice this in all contemporary pop music, and especially the sentimental stuff yeah. that that exists, that they've almost made an art form out of finding what you think are problems no one could ever understand. But then you think, oh, Jason Mraz right. understands. The first time I saw The Ledge... I I had that that fucking thing where it was uh, not exactly a girlfriend, you know, mm-hmm. it was a fucking rough situation, and it was just it wasn't exactly the the religious thing, and certainly not married, but I still felt like I could relate somehow to this movie, as if the idea of uh, girlfriend stealing was completely unique, and no right. other human being had ever gone through it. We talked a little bit about the ethics of that when we did the the film Closer, when uh-huh. we were talking about yeah. that. I'm not even really sure what to say other than that there's this odd strength in being able to to relate to this little tiny component of something that yeah. it kind of weasels its way into your heart for that. Uh, what's that proverb about throwing the heart? Oh, yeah. The proverb um, from Cemetery Junction about throw your heart out in front of you and then run ahead to catch it. Okay. So Cemetery Junction, which we've clearly chaptered into, this is what I was talking about when I said cheesy. Yeah. Somehow this movie delivers that, and it's perfect. Yeah. You don't question her for a second. That's kind of the Isn't that great? bizarre wonder of this whole movie. Of the whole movie. I is, know. I was just going to say that. You sit and watch this movie, and on paper, this is the most cliche coming-of-age story ever made. But for whatever reason, every beat is delivered yep. exactly the right way. It certainly for, is. So it's almost like for the first time you go that's why that happens in coming of age movies because it can work. Yeah. It's amazing to think. uh, So this is a movie set in 73. Mm -hmm. It's uh, written and directed by Ricky Gervais and Stephen Merchant. Mm -hmm. And it's perplexing for a lot of their audience because it's very unexpected. It's very unlike their other material. Yeah. It's somehow as a coming of age movie, a type of movie we don't talk about very often. It's one of the most effective in a genre. Yeah. And so we really absolutely. wanted to talk about that that element of it. Uh, before we do that, there's another strange thing about Ricky Gervais and Stephen Merchant in that everybody gets this idea, oh, hey, they're writing and directing. That's not a new thing for them. Right. They've basically been doing that since they've been working together. Yep, that's kind of the, their MO. When we, uh, we talked about the invention of lying and Ricky Gervais wrote and directed it with another person, that other person was not Stephen Merchant. That was not their joint. But these two worked together on The Office yep. and on Extras, both right. of which we talked about back when we did yeah. that show. Also on this new show, you've seen, I have not seen it yet, Yeah, called Life's Too Short. It's so good. Uh, we'll wait because I feel like there might be some more Warwick Davis showing up uh, mm. on Double Feature at some wow. point. Wow. There's like really few <laughs> Warwick Davis. Damn it. We've already done Leprechaun. <laughs> well, you know what? It might be one of those other movies. So I was reading an interview with them because I'm not going to lie. I didn't know why they did this movie. Yeah. I was just as perplexed about it because when you look at something like The Office or even extras, I mean, any of the stuff they've done, any of the stuff Ricky Gervais has ever been involved in, 
it tends to be, first of all, it tends to be comedy, yeah. which is not the first thing I would say this movie no, does. No, probably not even in the top three. Uh, but it has this sort of uh, ironic edge to it. Yeah. There's, uh, you know, it was hard for me to even really say, I guess it's underdogs a lot of the time. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I was reading this amazing interview where it was both uh, Ricky and Stephen Merchant talking about how, you know, their previous work celebrated the uncool, the unsexy. And so what they set out to do here was make something that wasn't ironic in any sense. That was a straight story that took a look at protagonists that were sexy, that were not, you know, the dorkiest kids in their class right. or had because you carry around a bag of problems with those characters. Sure. This is reading far more into what they actually said. But, you know, you and I can think about this coming on the show and always dealing with these films uh, that have misfits in them. Yeah. There's so many similarities between these films that we stopped talking about in year one because sure. we've covered them to death. Yeah. We know about the underdogs. You know, that's uh, those are characters we see in almost all of the movies mm -hmm. we do. So this allowed them to work outside of that box and deliver uh, really a message that was completely different, perhaps to an audience that was completely different. Yeah. It's also the British version of really a market that America has completely cornered. Yeah. You can say that about a lot of different subgenres of film, but I mean, our filmmakers uh, from today grew up in the 70s, uh, a vast lot of them at the very least. And so, you know, we get these sort of throwback coming of age. Detroit Rock City was one we did on the show. Yeah, definitely. The perfect and example. That, I mean, that is, that's in the 70s. Another that's throwback 70s. This isn't a coincidence. People are doing these almost nostalgic coming of age films, sure. dazed and confused type of films. Mm -hmm that are set during an era because they have a personal connection to that era. But this isn't just the uh, the sort of rebel without a cause, Saturday Night Fever type of thing. It's this kind of British pride. It's talking about a very specific British suburb, uh, you know, this kind of thing that Britain had with music. Yeah. You know, you think about a lot of the, I mean, I'm a big placebo guy, but you think back to like a David Bowie or sure. the Beatles or something right. to that effect. The British invasion. Yes, absolutely. The British invasion. We've had this uh, kind of swapping back and forth of classic British and American music and film never really had that. No. Film is American exports. We take things here and then we give them to other countries. Or other countries make them and then we give them back. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> Thank you, Rocky and Asia. Uh, but I think Britain has a hard time borrowing film things from America or just stealing them, co-opting them, yeah. right? Not borrowing them, but like this movie does, simply stating, you know what? The Brits can have a coming-of-age sure. movie. And it's going to be a damn good one. Right. We're going to find British actors for this right, coming of age exactly. movie. We're going to set it in a fucking British town. And here it is. Now that exists. Yeah. Well, I think and I think another thing that really kind of separates Cemetery Junction from something like Detroit Rock City is mm -hmm. Detroit Rock City because coming of age has been so done and overdone right. in the United States. With Detroit Rock City, you have to have these super exaggerated, almost villains, the mom. For yeah, example, right? Um, these oh, they're the absolutely police. villains. Yeah, but in Cemetery Junction, there's no bad guy. No, there isn't. It, the bad guy is the town. Yeah, the bad guy is the thought of becoming complacent sure. and dying the place you were born. Right, and and not necessarily in a literal sense, but dying in the same stakes. Maybe that you're even born in into. a literal sense. Well, both. I mean, that I mean, could be both. the case too. Yeah. If you, I mean, the title alone, the name of the town mm -hmm. is Cemetery Junction. It's right. where How perfect change goes to die. Right. right. <laughs> that's that's essentially, yep. that's, that's what I see in the name. Yeah. And you have all these characters who are unfulfilled. Everybody in this town is unfulfilled in mm -hmm. some way. Even the winners, Ray Fine's character yeah. who, who runs the assurance business He's not fulfilled. He's yeah. comfortable, but he's not a good guy. He doesn't no. know the names of his employees. He fires them because of, you know, their age or whatever. He That's called a forced retirement, sure. sir. He doesn't go Comes to with bed. A fruit bowl. He doesn't go to bed at night with a smile on his face. He goes to bed at night thinking about work the next day. Well, and thinking, he's still unsatisfied. He's trying to sure. force this life upon his daughter, you know. Yeah, exactly. And this is kind of the basic outline for all of the characters in this town. I think really the happiest guy in the town is the guy who works at uh at that the coffee cafe yeah, maybe. on the corner. I could see the that. The creepy perverted yeah, guy yeah, with yeah. the glasses. That or Carl Pilkington. He seems pretty happy to see our uh protagonist oh, walk God. in. Pilkington has a really brief scene where he's in 
this sort of aristocratic get up uh, at the party. And he's just kind of leaning back with his mouth agape. It's, yeah. it's perfect. It's absolutely wonderful. It's more than just a, a coming of age story, though. These characters all kind of point to it. It's an escape flick. Yeah. When we look at the coming of age stuff and the nostalgic stuff, it's already, it's kind of an interesting genre because the, the people most actively involved in it are, you know, you look at who is the market for a film like this. And immediately I think, okay, a younger generation, right? Sure. Somebody who's experiencing these problems. This is a critical age. This is uh, when you decide what to do with your life and it, you know, it doesn't necessarily happen the way you think it will. In most cases, it probably doesn't. Right. But this is when it's easiest. You're done with phase one. Phase two is wide open. You can do anything. And once you move well into phase two or however we're going to choose to divide this sure. up, it gets exponentially harder. You get tied down with things. Right. So they make this movie and, you know, I'm thinking back. I mean, when I was young, the 70s would alienate me. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I was born in the 80s. I would have been watching this film probably in the, the early or mid 90s. I had no interest in seeing a film from the 70s sure. because it would just push me away. I didn't understand the culture. Right. So, you know, I don't know if that's necessarily the sort of market or demographic or what well, have you I for think that either. They're, I think what they're going for is kind of the timelessness of the feeling. Sure. But I could totally understand. I mean, you and I were kind of, you and I were very counterculture. Sure. In, uh, in this, basically, the coming of age age. Yeah. So right, right. seeing something in the 70s and these people with their... Hooray. bright lights and everybody's yeah. kind of itching to do something that wasn't that wouldn't appeal to me <laughs> right right um but that's now it does i mean also granted i'm probably closer to their age now yeah than i sure. was in high school or in you know 90s or whatever when you're actually supposed to make those right. decisions but whoops you know i only saw this movie because of Stephen Merchant and ricky gervais i didn't there see it, is, it because yeah. i was looking for uh for someone to tell you what to do with your yeah. life yeah, so, you know, it could be a reminder, too. Um, we're totally looking at it the wrong way. It's obviously for a, a broader spectrum of people. Sure. And maybe it relates to them, or maybe it's a time capsule film. But either way, I think it effectively serves its point, which is the older you get, the harder it is to really do what you want. You know, make your mark. The Invention of Lying was a movie that urged you to live your life because there's nothing else. Yeah. There is no afterlife, and that was supposed to be enough to... You know, to light the fire, to get people fucking moving. Um, we were urging people on the show, get on with your life, <laughs> you know, go out and fucking do something. I think this is the same idea, but these two guys have uh, a different approach. Yeah. This is embodied perfectly when Freddie and Julie are talking uh, that first time. Uh, maybe not the very first time, when they're, they're sitting in a room talking yeah. about photography. Julie has these worldly aspirations that Freddie didn't even know were possible. Right. He didn't even think about them until then. And that makes Julie, I mean, an extremely powerful character. Right. Those ideas, if you ever wanted to make a, a feminist argument, you know, about uh, women physically not having as much power or via rights not having as much power or right. so much power lies in these ideas. Look at, okay, so here is this underage girl or in her early 20s or whatever, living with her parents mm -hmm. uh, under a household who still doesn't believe in women's fucking suffrage. Yeah. And she has all the power in the film via a couple simple ideas. I mean, that's uh, that's very empowering to me. They later joke that she's, you know, a woman's liber or whatever, but that kind of shows you, you know, this small town that these guys come from, uh, it still harbors decades old oppressive ideas yeah and it makes it even harder for them to get out of that uh you know that area but then you come back to julie and every last fucking thing she says you know the sure the, well freddie repeats it that's yeah. everything she says freddie uses as evidence <laughs> right. for why they need to get out of the town he yep. brings it up to his parents he brings it up to all his friends yeah. you can tell those ideas are really hitting home yeah. with him. he's excited about them and of course the the bar scene that you quoted from in such a powerful phrase but it's not all the good in things. It, the, the movie shows the opposite side of that, too. We were joking about the, the fruit bowl guy, yeah. the guy who retired. Uh, they're celebrating the departure of a man who's 65 and retiring. And so if you didn't start to get the idea already that, hey, maybe Fred's, you know, here's the thing about Fred. He thinks he's the one 
doing good and escaping and right. that his friends have the terrible life. Sure. They're going nowhere and he's going somewhere. Right. And it's not until he talks to Julie that she opens his eyes. Yeah. Well, it it just starts unraveling right there. And yeah, there's something else. He gets to see the woman whose husband died after yeah. they get they bought the insurance instead sure. of the holiday vacation. Right. And that is the straw that breaks the camel's back. That's when he realizes this is awful. This is not, this is, though it may provide, and though I may end up in a house with a family that I own by the time I'm 40, that's where that ends. Eventually, that's where the dream dies, still in Cemetery Junction. It it never expands. Yeah, you never made it out. (laughs) Yes. It's uh, it's weird that uh, these guys, you know, they probably think of inspiration in all these coming-of-age movies, but I think there's something almost, um, can I use a crazy word like Dickensian about it? You can try. It reminds me a little bit of A Christmas Carol. Mm-hmm. It's taking these different approaches to showing you all that could have been yeah. to make our second Nine Inch Nails reference of the day. <laughs> we have, uh, you know, the worldly aspirations, the great triumphant first step in. And we have the guy who's retiring and we have the vacation that never happened. Yeah, the guy who's retired, that scene is done so well. Yeah. It's so heavy. You can't help but be affected by it. You know, you hear he spent years doing nothing, and then you get the nail in the coffin if that wasn't enough. Oh, he spent the the last 30 years in the basement, you know, so full of life. Yeah. And there's just this pause, and everyone collectively in the room has to go, what are we doing here? Yeah. That's how you know you're doing the wrong thing. Sure. If you go to someone's retirement party... And they've been doing it their whole life, and that's and this fucking depressing. Bowl. Yeah, then you know it's time to bail. So I like that that Christmas Carol kind of idea of it. It's um, it's watching Freddy's illusion break down in three phases over the course of the film. He thinks he has a plan. He doesn't think he's at a dead end. And then through watching the movie, you see that in his head kind of decay. He uh. He realizes that there's a ladder to climb. That ladder just doesn't fucking go anywhere. It's not where he wants to go anyway. Right. What's great about that is that he realizes that within the film, far enough before the ending, that he can clearly do something about it, and we can get a nice little happy end out of this. And when he decides to go, when he finally makes that decision, they follow it with a party scene. Yep. You know what I mean? It's the first time anyone has any fucking fun throughout this entire movie. Sure. And it's short lived, but it's so, yeah. it's so, there's so much payoff. Well, it's and so because much of life. how upbeat it is yeah. compared to everything else. Finally, we have a plan. You know, it's the, uh, it's the after the plan music. Now we're rocking. It's inspirational. It's the point of the film. And then we arrive at the train chase. Yeah. Which uh, your hypothesis here is that this is uh, this is the way you know that everything worked in the film. Yeah. Because you get to the end of this film and it's really, it's slightly before the train chase. It's He gets off the train. He's well, been by himself. Well, even before that, you have the Emily Watson silent smackdown. Oh, that's true. Which we can't go through this whole episode without at least briefly that was, stating. That's an amazing moment in the uh, film. Emily Watson does so much with so little. Uh, she just, she has a very, she has almost a mute part sure. for this movie. And she just does incredible things with yeah. it. She becomes a very powerful character herself. But then you get to the train. Yeah, and... Freddie's sitting on the train by himself, and you kind of realize, okay, he's going to have to strike out on his own. In the last minute, they kind of pull a meat cart, and he's walking away. So then he turns the corner, and he sees Julie, and that's the moment where I go, okay, wow, this is, I'm actually feeling something here. (laughs) And they turn around, and they run toward the train, and it is the most cliche, quintessential coming-of-age moment where they're literally trying to catch the train yeah they're running towards the train they're trying it's to the ca- running the train is the getting train away without them they're yep. about to miss the train oh no their future yeah and they hop on at the last second and you just feel so relieved and they've finally gotten out of there and everything feels, it doesn't feel cheesy at all it no, feels fucking it's rock absolutely the most it's epic it validating really is a, yeah, moment it is it's completely valid yes. and then it's just one of the probably the funniest moment for me sure is when freddy goes i don't even know why we ran so fast there's another train in an hour yeah it's such a good payoff and it uh it's great because if the train didn't work for you then you have a joke but yeah. it fucking works for well, because everyone you can so. totally see that cynical guy who goes yeah. why are they running yeah there's right. gonna be another train it's and like- the fact that they make fun of themselves that's what takes me back a step and i go 
oh yeah, that was just the most cliche scene. Yeah. Because I wouldn't have even realized it. Sure. And the they're, film points They're out. basically living the cliche on yep. purpose. Yep. They're running after the train in it's the dramatic. same, yeah, the dramatic metaphorical right. sense. She says right. so, like wanted to make yeah. a dramatic entrance. Sure. And it's just all about them being just as validated as the audience at that point so there's one other thing and we have chapters carl fucking pilkington oh my god can we talk about carl pilkington for a second um we'll see you next time chapter or something get the fuck out of here uh carl pilkington so you did not tell me you've been doing a bad job as a friend i'm sorry i didn't know there was a season two of an idiot abroad i just abroad. assumed How everybody is this possible? knew there was a season how two. have you not been texting me after every episode oh. so i just found out there was a season two of an idiot abroad an Idiot Abroad, if we haven't talked about Carl Pilkington enough on our show It's the already. best show ever aired in the history of television. So this isn't something that Ricky and Steven wrote or whatever, but they did a podcast that we've talked about previously sure. with this guy, Carl Pilkington, who they endearingly think is one of the dumbest creatures on planet yeah, Earth. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, our closest link to our ape-like ancestors. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they're friends. Yeah. And they, they do me. I mean, Ricky really loves this guy. He really looks out for this guy. And he wants to show him to the universe. Uh He wants to show everyone this magnificent thing that is Carl Pilkington. I think the best way I could describe who Carl Pilkington is, and I realized this during the second season of the show An Idiot Abroad, is that he's accidentally profound. Yeah. That just in watching Carl Pilkington, magic just cut. You don't even have to write it. It's as if you're writing that ironic character that Ricky deals with so well. Sure. But he's just writing himself. Yeah. And it's so, uh, it would almost be too much if you wrote him. Right. And a lot of people suspected during their podcast uh-huh. and during their audiobooks that this was a character that Ricky came up with. It would almost be too ridiculous. Mm-hmm. The point would be made way too too far. <laughs> You'd be hammering it in. Well, I just don't know how person. somebody could come up with it unless they believed I it. I know. I know. So An Idiot Abroad is simply a travel show, right? Yeah. Where, uh, a travel in the, documentary. In the first season, it was... Um, the Seven Wonders of the World. That was you. Carl Pilkington's Seven Wonders. And then the uh, the second, what do they call it? Series 2. Series, Series 2 because of it's An English. Idiot Abroad. Yeah. Uh, the second season of it. That's uh, That's a bucket list that Carl gets to choose. So they give him a little bit more freedom here. They give him a hundred things that he can choose and from. Then, and they just lambast his decisions. <laughs> the, the most obvious one, and I joked about it in the beginning, is he chooses to swim with dolphins. And by the oh, time great. he finally gets there, after being mugged by monkeys, is... Can you yes. spoil it? I don't think you should spoil it. Uh, I yeah, think it's, I'm not going to spoil they it. They give you a turn on, on yeah, each there's of a his turn. things. But I think my favorite episode of An Idiot Abroad of all time uh-huh. is Carl Pilkington on Route 66. There are so many moments where Carl comes to these realizations, and by seeing his gears spin slowly, you do all these complicated things in your right. own head. There's a brief moment where he's in, uh, it's Bangkok, right? With the Lady Boys? Yeah, and yeah. so he's faced with all of these uh, these men that have changed their gender or in the process of it, and he comes upon this realization that he would love his wife even if she had previously been a man. The Just only these, difference oh, is God. that the only difference is that she would have to do more work around the house, right? Well, then he follows it up with something like that. It's, I yeah. mean, it's really amazing. And so Stephen and uh, Ricky are actually in the series with him briefly. Yeah. They um they chat at the beginning and then they call and text and it's really funny. Yeah, they basically just harass they just, him. Yeah, they just prod the, him. Oh god, it's great. Carl Pilkington, man. Carl Pilkington. Oh, I love where it ends too. Okay, enough about an idiot abroad. <laughs> this is not an idiot abroad uh show. This is the end of this episode of Double Feature. We have a website that is doublefeatureshow.com. You can find whatever I promised would be on there on there. <laughs> and uh you can send us an email, doublefeatureshow at gmail dot com. We haven't done one of these in a while, okay? But I believe it's our last of the trifecta this year. Oh, are we doing some Herschel Gordon Lewis, Takashi Miike? Two filmmakers that we still felt like we didn't quite know enough about. Wait, this worked out great because we've done this now with um, Dario Argento, right? And I don't know about you, but I'm feeling really comfortable oh, with yeah. the Dario Argento. I love Argento, but Herschel Gordon Lewis and Takashi Miike still a little uncomfortable. Still don't get them enough. We're gonna do. Um, some quintessential material from both of the directors. Oh, yeah. Okay. The films on we'll the be show there. Blood Feast and Audition. I'm actually going to be awake this time. It's going to be great. <laughs> Watch more fucking film. Bye.